All right. Um, welcome everyone to our monthly webinar for this month. My name is Caroline and I'm with Wayfront and I'm just going to take care of quick housekeeping items before we hand things over to our presenter, Steve. So first of all, please note that we are recording the session um, and we will make it available to you tomorrow um, in an email so you can have it to review. Um, second item to note is that we will be answering questions during this webinar. So if at any point um, you have a question, please feel free to um, type in the chat window. Um, if you click on the icon at the bottom of your screen for the chat window and you can type in your questions, um, we will get to them um, as we go. And then we will save some time at the end specifically to answer questions as well. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand things off to Steve Tilden, who is our presenter today, and let him introduce himself. Hey, guys. Thank you for joining. Um, like Caroline said, we're going to be answering questions during the webinar. So feel free to um, you know, ask me any questions or interrupt as I go. Um, we're here to make sure that you get value out of this. So hopefully um, that's what we're about to do. Uh, all right. So I think it's important to start um, when you look at Wavefront to understand how we treat or how we think of a metric. Um, to us, a metric is anything measurable um, within your data uh, based on a time series. So a metric to us is fairly simple, very open format. It starts with the metric name itself. Um, Everything from CPU to RAM to memory to different systems all fit into that naming scheme. Um, the data value itself, you're trying to pass for the metrics. So a CPU percentage or RAM consumption amount, et cetera. Um, the timestamp, um, all our timestamps are epoch time, essentially, and then they're translated to the viewer's uh, viewing window. Um, and then the source name. So for us, the host or um, the VM, the, the the machine or system that's generating the metric um, or for which that metric is pertinent for um, is the source. So um, usually that's the system name, um, but that could be application server specific, et cetera. Um, and then optional point tags. So we treat optional point tags and, and these are dimensionalities that you may apply to a metric. Um, things like environment equals production or development. Um, or a service name, or a population of people, like a customer name, for example. Um, so it's really any additional dimensionality you want to pass in with those metrics that allow you to later on truly analyze the data where it's meaningful to you. Um, so that's how we treat a metric. And to note, the point tags are essentially properties of the metric, and that allows us um, essentially to link and associate those dimensionalities across a vast body of metrics at scale. Um, it can be anything being measured over time. Um, we've had people and customers measure everything from a transaction, which is of course like an overall sale, um, to an application paradigm activity. So, uh, you know, a, a cash server was relieved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a lightweight data model, of course, and, and like I said, it enables real-time use. So the way we treat it, we can query these at scale. And of course, we have a full flexibility within this format to compare metrics based on the time series. So essentially, um, we can aggregate, compare, and do math on metrics across different time series and different metric families. Hang on there. It looks like we lost Steve's sound for a bit. He will be. I'm sorry. I... There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I think I accidentally muted myself there. I was talking. <laughs> so um, there's really seven uh, ways to get data, get those metrics into Wavefront. Um, 
and it starts with the wavefront agents. So wavefront agents might be deployed on a VM or an AWS or Google or Azure instance um, or a pod, um, but they're a lightweight uh, facility for you to deploy and get additional information, additional metrics about the system itself. Um, things that, for example, CloudWatch might not give you, like something simple like RAM, for example. Um, the second method is logs via TCP or via FileBeat. Um, Wavefront provides something called the Wavefront proxy, and within that we've implemented the Lumberjack protocol um, and Java Grok. So you can send us or stream or beat us files, log files, and we'll apply Grok patterns on those and convert those into metrics into your Wavefront instance. Three, developers can instrument their code um, via a set of SDKs, a full REST API, or even metrics directly. Um, so they can instrument uh, their methods, their services, um, and any code they have to send us metrics about those particular applications or their behavior directly into WebFront. Um, we also will reach out. Um, you heard me mention AWS and GCP and Azure. Um, we have various integrations, um, which we call active service integrations, where we will reach out and query that service layer for information. And that includes the major cloud platforms. So essentially, and you'll see this during the demo, um, you set up your account information, some permissions, um, and you're off and running and you have all your information from your major cloud providers. Um, we can take data from your infrastructure and platforms. So within Wavefront, um, you'll see, when I bring up the integrations page, we have things like uh, vSphere, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, uh, PKS. Um, so all of your major infrastructure and platforms, Wavefront already has built out integrations that allow you to stream data and metrics directly from those platforms. Um, and of course, I mentioned earlier, uh, when I was talking about the SDKs, there's direct data ingestion. So you can feed us data directly into your Wavefront instance using an API token. So very, very key. Um, you may not have a programmatic facility. You know, some of your machines may be older, um, or maybe they're just you know uh, lightweight switches, et cetera, and you need to do something a little bit more custom, if you will, and you might need to send this data directly, you can do that as well with Wavefront. Now, I kind of skipped over derived metrics, but we can take all of these metrics from all of these different methodologies and periodically derive mathematical transformations from them. Um, we do that at scale, and we call that derived metrics. So seven different ways to really produce and ingest metrics into Wavefront. Now, talk about the Wavefront proxy a little bit. So again, this is something I mentioned. We implement the uh, Lumberjack protocol, et cetera. Um, and you'll see that down here. We have that little file beat logo or little file beat VM. Um, but the Wavefront proxy does a lot of interesting things for you. Um, so part of Wavefront is we do distributed tracing. You'll see that in one of those center boxes. Um, we take in those metrics in that Wavefront metric data format. We'll even take in metrics via open TSDB format or Graphite. Um, and the Wavefront proxy includes things like preprocessors, so um, rules that you can define um, and configure. Allows the proxy to take some metrics coming in and massage them a bit, really make them more meaningful for you, more useful for you later. Um, so there's that preprocessor as well. And again, it, it supplies the functionality for all of our distributed tracing um, and our histograms. So I'll speak a little bit about that later, but Wavefront um, actually calculates the value or the, re the, the result of histograms at query time. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So the Wavefront proxy is really a powerful facility for you to get many different types of metrics um, or log data into metrics, et cetera, into your Wavefront instance. All right, and I'm going to bring up some Wavefront. All right, let's see if I can maximize this guy here. So when we start to look at Wavefront, I think we really have to start with the integrations page. You heard me talk about all the different ways to get data into Wavefront, and what that eventually means is over 200 plus integrations. So all these 
icons or buttons, if you will, or all the easy buttons to get data flowing into and out of Wavefront for use in intelligent alerts and your analytics for your states, um, your dashboards, but also into other external systems you might need it in, PagerDuty, OpsGenie, et cetera. Now, if we look here in my demo environment, we have most of the featured integrations enabled, um, all your major cloud platforms, AWS, Azure, et cetera, um, Kubernetes, those V properties I was talking about. But if we scroll down, we see a huge wealth of platforms and services, application platforms, cloud services that you can turn on and instantly facilitate via Wavefront. Um, again, um, it's a variety of different things, everything from your web servers to your data stores, messaging, et cetera, but not just to do analytics or get those real-time intelligent alerts. Um, again, to get data back out of Wavefront. Um, so um, find out what's going on, um, notify the right people, and notify them in a facility they're already used to, like I said, OpsGenie or ServiceNow or Slack. And of course, the ever open webhook. So let's take a look at one of these real quick. I mentioned uh, some of our major cloud platforms. Let's take a look at AWS and what it takes to turn this on. So I come in here, I'm given a great list of metrics. So we have AWS metrics flowing and we kind of have this metrics browser we're immediately prompted with and I can click on a few of these and turn on the metrics very quickly. A great facility for just browsing and discovering the metrics for a particular integration. And if I look at the setup tab um, and click on this big green button right here, we'll see the seven easy steps it takes to get my AWS data flowing into Wavefront. It's as simple as um, navigating to my access management in AWS, creating a particular role, giving me the right access, if you will, the right permissions so that when Wavefront calls out to AWS, we, can <laughs> we won't get some sort of error and we can actually retrieve the data. Um, just take a look at it, make sure everything's okay, and boom, click setup and you're good to go. Now, once we do that, in this environment, we have several uh, accounts set up. Um, we have a huge wealth of dashboards right out of the box available to me just because I turned on my AWS integration. So everything from uh, my um, elastic load balancers to my EC2 instances, uh, if I'm using Beanstalk or Lambda functions or Redshift. So all of these dashboards are pre-built and available. So as soon as I turn on these services or turn on my AWS account, I can come in and start taking advantage of these immediately. Now, let's take a look at what that might look like once we do that. So if we start with a global view, um, we're given this, which is really a live representation of my particular, my instances for my accounts in my AWS environments. And you can see we have several accounts listed here. We've set up several. Um, but these are a true representation of what I have going on right now. If I had any instance failures or system status check failures, I would see those in these colorful little buttons up here. But if I click on one, I'm given a region view. So an overall summary or satellite view, if you will, of that entire AWS region. And by default, um, of course I checked on status fail. <laughs> by default, it should sort it by CPU utilization. Um, and if I roll my mouse over any of these guys, I'm given a quick visual or a quick analytic, a chart if you will, to give me an idea of what the CPU utilization looks like on those particular boxes. Now I can change this metric. Um, I can look at all sorts of stuff, uh, network in, out, CPU, status, credits, et cetera. So if I change this and look at something, for example, like disk write ops, I'm gonna get a different set of red and yellow boxes up here. And if I roll my mouse over, it will change that instant visualization or analysis into the metric I'm most interested, most interested in. I can also group by some dimensionality. So these are tags that are brought back and discovered as part of your instances in AWS. Things like role or job, um, deployment, team, et cetera. So if I group these up by role, I can see these instances with a bit more clarity. And of course, in our demo environment, I have a bunch of machines with no role because we haven't assigned any roles to them. Um, but I do have a few that we're really trying to categorize and organize 
effectively in our dev environment, which is uh, some DB boxes, we have some management machines, uh, a proxy, an engine, some QA machines, a bunch of one box, um, uh, of course, a load testing machine, etc. Again, I can sort these and organize these um, by all these different metrics. Now, if I scroll down, I'm given a, a great 30,000 foot view of my entire region um, in AWS. Everything from disk reads, CPU utilization, storage IOPS, network, um, and a lot of top 10 performers. So um, my, my greatest defenders for network in or out, or um, you know, perhaps it's uh, the greatest uh, consumers of EBS storage, for example. But all of this, a very nice satellite view of what's going on within my instances, what's going on within this region that might be meaningful for me. And if I scroll down, I can see I got quite a few machines here consuming quite a bit of storage. Um, so I can click on one of these guys. And now I'm looking at that particular instance and its activity within that region. So I started at a global view, that satellite view, if you will, um, and really drilled down through uh, my particular estate. Um, and the entire time, Wavefront has kept that experience for me. So I have that breadcrumb trail, if you will. I can go back up to the region or even all the way back up to that global view and really start discovering or drilling down through and, and getting an idea of what's happening with my estate. All right, so that's all I had for AWS real quick. Um, if there's no questions, I'll jump into um, a bit more of why we're Wavefront and why we, it is we do what we do. Okay. All right, so why Wavefront? Underneath Wavefront, we've built a powerful query language. So, um, yes, our platform is highly scalable. We've done a, a ton of work around our data platform, our ingestion layers, our engines to transform data. Our query engine we built on top of that is exceptionally powerful. Now, in this case, I'm an ops guy and I got a pager duty alert. And the alert said that my transactions per second was dropping beyond a reasonable threshold. And within that alert, I had a link to this dashboard. Now, immediately upon getting into this dashboard, it's readily apparent that indeed my transactions per second are dropping. I'm even shown the red alert box letting me know that yes, this alert is occurring. And if I roll my mouse over, I can see that indeed the aggregate transaction rates have dropped by greater than 10% over a recent period, and that's what keyed the alert. Now, again, we built this powerful query engine on top of Wavefront. So I can ask interesting questions about the data. And those point tags that provide me the dimensionality, those environment equals, uh, customer equals, et cetera, I can use to slice and dice the data, really analyze what's occurring. So I might do something like um, look at this by customer. And when I do, I see that all my customers are affected. It's really across the board. There's no customer that's being saved from this event. All of my transactions are dropping uh, really ubiquitously. Now, this could be anything. Uh, this could be, again, your environment, customers, et cetera, or something like App Server. Now, when I do this and I select it by App Server, I get lucky. And I notice that I really only have this one bad actor here. And by looking at my legend, I can see that this guy is named App5. So App5 appears to be misbehaving, and the rest seem to be okay. And I can see that very clearly because I was really able to slice and dice it by some um, added dimensionality that I'm passing in. Now, in this case, I'm going to select app five. So I've seen that that's my bad actor. I'm going to select him. And what that does is that controls this noisy chart over here on the right. And I've got every kind of thing we've thrown in here. So uh, everything from network packets sent to CPU user percentage, cache requests, network latency, cache hits, et cetera, just kind of everything, including the transactions per second. And we can see that line, it mirrors exactly the, the chart on the left. So we know this is our bad actor, this is definitely app five. Now, in that query language that Wavefront's built, 
um, we have the ability to ask very advanced questions of our data. We can do things like, show me a forecast of what this might look like in the future. Um, or show me a moving correlation of what this data might, might mean compared to this particular pattern over here. So take a pattern I'm giving you, correlate it to that, and show me the data that's only meaningful or seemingly related to that other data. And that's actually what we built into this dashboard here. We built a moving correlation into this dashboard. So I can click on this guy and say correlate my transaction count. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna take all of that noisy data in the right-hand chart and try to find any of that data that matches the pattern or the shape of this line of app five. So the transactions per second for app five. And what it's done, we immediately see the signal and the noise. So we've taken all that noisy chart, essentially 10,000 plus points in that chart and just asked Wavefront, to judge the shape of the line on the left and bring out all the things that might be meaningful with all that data on the haystack, if you will, on the right. And what it's brought out, if we take a quick look, is free memory seems to be dropping, the errors in the logs seem to be increasing, and garbage collection count is all over the place and going up. So it seems to be something wrong with garbage collection. Now, me as an ops guy, I know we just pushed a build this morning, so there may be an issue with that build and it may be occurring on F5. So I might want to take this, just create a quick link. Just like that, I have a short link that I can send to any dev, any other ops guy, dev on call, and let them know what's happening with App5. Now I can re-spin the box, re-roll it, um, but now they know they can go and they actually address the issue. And they, they know not just that something's occurring, but it has something to do with the Java code, probably the build um, around the collection um, on that particular machine. So take that knowledge, move with it, and take action on what we know now. Any questions? Or? All right. Okay. All right, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, with Wavefront and our query language, um, our users, our customers, um, often are able to do things that may not be possible or may be hard to come by with other solutions um, or other vendors out there. So we often get requests for things um, like this, what I brought up here, where a customer or a prospect has asked us to look into some of their dirty data, some of their data that's a bit noisy um, or might have occurrences where it's hard to weed out and maybe they're getting a lot of alert fatigue from it. In this case, um, our customer was getting a lot of false positive alerts on dips like these. Um, now these are just essentially active passive failover events. Everything is still handled, but they cause this little dip. For them, these were causing false alarms. Um, in reality, this is the outage event they wanted to capture. So what was happening with them is they would get a lot of false alerts on all these events and it would really just kind of fall into the noise when they were having an actual occurrence of something. So how do we get rid of these and still know about our event? Well, let's take a look. I'm gonna copy this query. I'm gonna start trying to smooth this out a little bit. So first thing I'm gonna do is just apply a simple transformation here. Let me get a moving window and just apply a moving average. Now when I do that, I can see that it smoothed out my pattern somewhat. So it's gotten rid of a little bit of the noise, but not exactly what I was looking for here. Let's get rid of that. Now I know in this particular instance, a moving median might work better. So if I roll my mouse over that, I can take a look at that line and see, yeah, it looks like those dips, those, those sharp downward spikes are smoothed out pretty good. Let me apply that moving median. All right. And now I've got the line I want. All of those false alerts are that dirty part of the data, if you will, is weeded out and I'm left with only my event. I'm gonna get rid of this guy here. I don't need him anymore. And I have a nice clean line. Now, in order to key on this event, it's important to know that something has changed. Um, so 
these numbers are across hosts and we can't rely on this 280K or this 270K as some sort of static threshold that might be persistent. So what we have to do is we create a dynamic threshold. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna look at a rate of change. Essentially, we're gonna say, hey, look at what you were doing 10 minutes ago and look at what you're doing now. And if that changes dramatically or drops, then let me know about it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is copy this query. Now I've got two lines and I'm just gonna apply a lag to one of them. So I'm gonna make one of these guys 10 minutes ago. I'll come in here, I'll choose lag and just click it. All right, now I've got my two queries, both my lag, my moving median, all set up here. And I've got 10 minutes ago and now. So now I need to calculate my rate of change. Now this one's already named current activity. So I'm gonna name this one lag. And I'm gonna add another query line here, just below this. Now, we need to do some math. We need to take what was happening a little bit ago and divide it by what's happening now, or vice versa, um, to get that rate of change. And I can do that very readily with the query language. I even have autocomplete facilities. So it sees that I've named those two query lines as two different transformations of my data current lag, and it makes those available to me to now do advanced math on them. In this case, it's actually pretty simple math. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to take the current, divide it by the lag, and I know that a rate of change is going to be measured in a very different scope than 280K or a very different scale. So I'm going to put that on the right-hand side, and right away I'm giving that signal. So now I have something that I can key on, something that I can measure and have as a definable moment of when the issue both started occurring and when it healed itself. So now I can take that information, that data, and go build an intelligent alert on it. If I'm not interested in these existing lines, I can just take those off the chart, and now I have my clean signal. And it's as easy as clicking this guy here, and I can go create an alert off that right away. So taking dirty data, if you will, noisy data, smoothing it out, getting rid of that noise, and still pulling out clear, definable signals, not based on static thresholds, but dynamic values calculated by transformations using our query language. All right, so let's take a look at what um, creating a wavefront alert might look like. So I'm gonna go and alert. Instance for the demo, um, I'm going to say uh, latency is high. Um, I don't need my alert. Now, in this case, I am going to do something on request latency. So it's nice, it's got some noisy data in it. We can transform it a little for demo purposes. It's a great thing to show when you're creating an alert. Um, so, oops, turn that back on. Just going to do requests dot latency. So, what this is, it's a uh, really a measurement of um, my latency when a request goes into any one of my particular app servers. So as I roll my mouse over this, you can see I've got a lot of app servers in here and they've all got various amounts of request latency as they go on through the day. Now in this case, I wanna create a threshold alert. I also wanna do something, I'm not really interested in a particular moment or a particular request latency. I'm really kind of interested in if one of my app servers seems to be peaking and hitting a higher request latency at any given period window of time. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna apply a transformation. Um, I'm gonna look at a moving window again, but in this case, I'm gonna look at a moving max. So essentially a moving 10 minute window, and if I see any of these app servers with a, with a maximum in a 10 minute window above a certain threshold, let me know about it. All right. So this looks pretty good. This, this looks nice. I can see some nice delineated behaviors of a few of my app servers. This is exactly what I was looking for. All right. Now, what's cool about this is I can enter, oops, don't want to scroll up. I can enter in various different levels of thresholding in essentially define those as different moments. So I can say, for example, uh, 250 could be a severe in my instance, whereas uh, 240 or 230 might just be a smoke or a warning. 
Um, in this case, 250 looks decent. I, I kind of want to zoom out a little bit here. Look at a little bit larger window. Um, yeah, yeah, 250 looks decent. That looks like a good alert. My normal behavior, um, I'm not really getting there, but it's close. I'm gonna add alert target. So if I peek above 250 for any of these guys, um, I wanna send that uh, to PagerDuty. So let's send that to the ops team because that might be um, something occurring. But really I see a few of these kind of getting up there and, and getting close. I do want to get some warning about that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set a threshold at 240 um, and then I'm gonna add a target for that. Now in this case, we can see that if I you know, back over my window as I'm back testing this, I've got a few of these that are going to fire, so that might be a little noisy. In this case, I'm going to put those into Slack. So take my severes, exceptions, or incidents, if you will, and give those to one channel of people or one channel of recipients, um, and take my warnings or my bit noisier uh, alerts and send those to a channel where I'm going to have a bit more people paying attention, but they, it may not be so frantic when they see it. Right. And then I can add additional information, enter tags that might affect this or that I want to pass data through, um, et cetera. So very easy to create an alert, um, do transformations. Now I did a simple transformation in this case, but any of the transformations you saw me do, um, you can do in creating a wavefront alert. All right. So, I mentioned earlier that Wavefront also has the ability to do powerful distributed tracing. Um, last year, we introduced distributed tracing as part of Wavefront to allow developers, um, application teams, and ops teams really optimize the performance of their applications, identify and isolate bottlenecks, and even troubleshoot. Um, so when I go into a list of my tracings. Wavefront provides a clean view of all the services discovered um, as, that are enabled um, using distributed tracing in Wavefront, as well as some of the uh, larger frameworks that we're able to discover. Things like gRPC or .NET or Django. Um, and it gives me a visual cue of those services and what might constitute them. Now, in my environment, in my set of services, I know that everything stop, starts at the shopping app. So my customers come in, they go to shopping, and I'll start there. So I'm gonna start there, and what I'm given is a summary level or another satellite view of my entire shopping service. So essentially, everything about um, my particular service and what I'm seeing in the current behavior. Now we'll give you a high level, what we call the REDS view, the request rates, the error rates, and the durations, as well as the top numbers of requests, fails, um, and your slowest requests. Now it's important to note that we calculate duration as a P95. Again, these are wavefront histograms. These are calculated at query time. An average doesn't really make sense when you're looking at high velocity requests into services. So we'll show you this as a P95 by default, so you can truly judge um, where your slowest parts of your application might be misbehaving. Again, this is all calculated at query time. Um, so we can do things like slice this by the particular cluster um, or the particular shard, um, even the sources themselves, any of the point tags or dimensionality uh, you want to provide, as well as um, get a detailed or summarized view. So I'm starting out, I'm looking at a summarized view, um, but if I click on the detailed view, I can see um, all of the data underneath that comprises those larger aggregates, those larger summaries that it's showing me. And if I roll my mouse over um, this P95 duration, I can actually see all the individual histograms that comprise that larger aggregate. Um, so I can see that Essentially, these larger hiccups or peaks in my um, request durations um, don't seem to be coming from any particular shard or location or cluster. I can see that all immediately just by rolling my mouse over it and seeing that in the detailed view. Now, I'm gonna zoom into one of these particular requests, one of these events, and just take a look at this. Now, when I do that, 
Um, again, I can see everything about those. Um, but since I'm interested in this particular duration of it, I'm going to synchronize the time of all these charts. Essentially, what I've done is say, hey, this is an event I'm interested in. I've zoomed into that. Mirror all of those time windows across all these other ones and kind of relate that data. Um, and when I do so, I can see that I have a couple of services that don't look like the rest. Um, so once we call shopping, you know, several other services are called uh, subsequently as part of our service layers. Um, two of those, order shirts and get style, seem to be the bulk of those durations. They're really taking quite a bit of time and nothing close to the other services. Now, I can scroll down here and take a look at how that looks in Jersey. Again, order shirts seem to be my big offender. Um, or even get some drop wizard stats or look at the JVM itself. Um, but I'm going to click on order shirts. This seems to be a service that is not acting like the rest. And what I'm shown is a clear view of all of my spans and traces uh, that I have for that service. So Wavefront's brought me into a span search view, uh, but it's kept my context. So it knows that I've gone, I started at the beach shirt service, I started with shopping, I drilled down into order shirts, and, and that's what I'm looking at. It's also kept that synchronization of the time window I'm interested in. So if you take a quick look, this actually shows a reflection of that P95 duration chart in essence. Um, and we can click on any one of these spans and go immediately to the details about that particular span. So I'm going to click on this one and just see what comes up. Now, what I'm given is a view of the entire request flow through all of my services in, and this particular span. So I came into shopping, shopping called get style, get style called make shirts, make shirts called printing, printing called print shirts. After we printed the shirts, we had to package them, so we called gift wrap. Gift wrap was called, and if I look at this diagram here, this orange line indicates the critical path of my services, essentially um, where my code is calling and where it's returning from. Um, and I can see that in this case, packaging.gifwrap is the bulk of all of the duration of this particular span. Um, and that might be indicative of something there. So it may not be order shirts in particular, but it might be this packaging gift wrap leading call um, now I can see all the data for that particular span um, everything from the location environment all those point tags are passing into us um, even what you know framework we use for that service and if I did have an error on this we would see it in here we would see the error has been populated and we would actually know see it right here um, but because I can see that packaging gift wrap seems to be a little bit aberrant or doing something misbehaving, the duration seemed to be peaking, I can drill immediately into that particular packaging dashboard. So again, now I've gone from that summary or higher level view of all my services, I've gone down through, clicked on some offending services, gone all the way through, and now I'm really down um, to the one that seems to be the offending service. Again, it's kept my, my window of time, my context, if you will, as I've drilled down through. Um, and immediately I see that, yep, yeah, this appears to be what I'm, what I'm looking for is packaging gift wrap is really taking all the requests here. So I can scroll down and start looking at other behaviors, other factors about this particular service. Um, and when I do, there's another thing that stands out similarly down here. My median response payload and request payloads for these are off the charts. I mean, if I compare them to some of the other services, it goes from the order of single or tens or maybe maybe 100 bytes all the way up to 10K. And we can see that our responses are just huge for the gift wrap service. Now, again, I know we recently made an update to our code. Um, so that might indicate that that code needs to be optimized. Perhaps it's not paging properly or um, not streaming the response as it should. Um, so we need to look at that. I need to actually tell the developer and let him know that that particular service, the gift wrap service, might need to get looked at. Um, so now I have all that data. I have focused in on really 
the exact method that's being called that's causing our issue, hopefully, maybe even down to a few lines of code the developer has to go look at. All with a few clicks, starting with a high level view of all the services we've discovered, all the way down to the particular method call that's causing us those higher durations. And that's it. So I'll open it up now for any questions, uh, any uh, Q&A you guys might have that might help uh, clarify um, anything about Wavefront. And just as a reminder, um, you can use the chat window to type in your questions. Um, and those will be sent just to the panelists. So um, they will be anonymous to the rest of the folks on the call. Um, see a few starting to come through. Um, I know one question, this here's a question we get often, um, is people, how do, how do we do pricing for Wayfront? If you could speak to that a little bit, Steve. Uh, that's a great question, Caroline. So the good thing about Wavefront um, is that we charge purely on ingestion rate. So there's no additional cost for things like custom metrics or if you happen to be an auto scaling shop, things like the number of host IDs or anything like that. It's purely your ingestion rate at which you're flowing metrics into your Wavefront instance. Now we measure that in something we call points per second. So imagine you're sending us one metric every second from a particular host and you have 100 of those, that would be 100 points per second. And what we do is we average that rate, essentially that velocity, if you will, um, how it looks hourly, and we take a 95th percentile of that over a month. So that way you have essentially some facility that handles those peaks and valleys that you normally occur and you're not having any overages. Um, so it's purely velocity. It's based on points per second. Um, and there's no additional charges for things like custom metrics or additional hosts. Great question, Caroline. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I'll hand it back to Caroline. Um, I see a couple more coming through. Um, Perfect. I don't know if you have your chat window open. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There, there we go. All right. Two more come through. Yep. Uh, e and prod with on off flagged instrument bad. JVMs. Um, we do profiling um, in the form of distributed tracing and via our SDKs. So our SDKs allow you to send a metric based on pretty much anything. Um, as far as like JVM instrumentations, um, we don't put an agent into the JVM to say instrument it from the inside, if you will. Um, but we do integrate with things like Jalokia and other things that do the same. So we have the ability to see through other JVM agents and see into the JVM garbage collection incidences and all that stuff. Um, but we won't essentially instrument or hook into the JVM to do custom profiling. Um, I know some APM vendors out there do that. I, I think if it helps to conceptualize, Wavefront, I like to say, is a bit more than just an APM. Right, so we can take all your code in via your SDKs. We can take in those direct metrics, as I mentioned at the beginning. We have our distributed tracing, which really allows you to instantiate three simple objects and boom, you know, open tracing is enabled. Um, but we're not really trying to be an APM per se, right? We're really trying to provide the scalable platform on the back end that allows you to get metrics in in any number of open facilities so that it's easy for you um, scale that data so you can query it using that massive query engine at, at size, at velocity, at scale, um, and then also utilize all those other facilities like JVM, instrumentation, et cetera. Um, so kind of give you a, a holistic platform and environment to um, optimize your applications um, you know, and do all those things. So some of the things APMs might do a little bit differently and do a little bit more of, and that I think would fall, the profiling capabilities would probably fall into that subtle category. Uh, 
Awesome. Any other questions? Um, something I want to point out while we're on here is we do, um, we get asked this quite a bit is with our, is there a free version of Wayfront? Is there, can we try this? And yes, we do have um, free trials. Um, if you go to wayfront.com slash sign up, we have, you can click on the free trial button here. Um, we offer a 30 trade trial. You don't have to put in your credit card or anything, just your name um, and your work email. Um, so that we can be able to contact you and send you a link to get started. Um, and you're able to try out the full product um, for free. Um, and you'll, once you do sign up, you'll get an email from someone like Steve, who's uh, also willing to kind of be there for support should you need it as you uh, try out your way friend. Yeah, and one of the cool things about signing up for a trial is because we're a SaaS based uh, observability platform, you can essentially turn on some systems, whether it's, you know, cloud property, you know, on-prem stuff or whatever, very easily and start flowing data in and get an idea of what it might look like in us. And like uh, Caroline said, when you do so, you get assigned to someone like me that will sit with you and kind of help you up through those, that, that curve of learning in the beginning, if you will, um, get you, you know, off and off and running. So very helpful. Very good. Well, we seem to have a quiet bunch today, but that's all right. We appreciate your attentiveness um, in joining our uh, call today. Um, as a reminder, we'll send out a copy of this recording to you tomorrow. And um, if you have any questions or uh, want to know more, feel free to um, contact us. Um, visit our website. Um, there's links, contact us, also links for the trial. Um, so with that, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you for presenting for us today. And thank you, everyone else. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Caroline. Have a great day.